Well, so, hello, well, Becky. Well, How are you? How do you I'm do? Lovely. lovely to meet you, by the way. Yeah, great. Um, where where mm -hmm. are you? Where where are you having? I'm at you? home, actually. This is my first gig this year. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think it might be mine too, as well. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was a strange year. Hasn't it been? How have you? Um, how have you found it all? Sorry. How have you found it? How have you? How have you been thriving in 2020? Oh well, I mean. Just try to to get by, basically, you know, because every month, you know, there were different decisions, you know, political decisions and different uh, developments of the uh, pandemic and everything. So uh, in the beginning, I mean, I actually, I think we had a gig in January in, uh, in, in, in Sweden or, or Norway, if I get it right. And that was the last one. And then uh, we... Um, we intend to do some uh, recording for the next album, and uh, and then we were not allowed to go to the place where we wanted to record, and mm -hmm. and then everything became really really difficult. And I'm um, basically at home, you know, which is a complete new situation for me because the last thirty years, you know, I was constantly on the road or in the studio working mm -hmm. with other people, and this strange disease, you know, is really, yeah. It prevents a lot of uh, things that I, I was used to, you know, over the, the past couple of decades. Yeah, it's been a big change, isn't it? Have you, um, how, have... how about you? How did you yeah, get by? I, I, I've always written, since I've joined the music industry, I've always written with other people. And I think this pandemic kind of forced me to write by myself again and I kind of realized that I, I started writing music when I was 13 and it was like on my own in my bedroom and then when I got into the industry I just kind of got used to writing people writing with other people um so it was nice to be able to kind of get my confidence back up with writing again which is which is really lovely to do yeah yeah, yeah I, I, I mean um so you're writing you're writing your, your own songs and your own your own material that's great yes that's really yes. great. Uh, so the only other cover I think I've released has been a song called Only You. Um, oh God, I can't remember who did that actually originally. So oh. you wrote it for somebody else? No, it was an old cover. Um, oh, the, probably... Only You? All right. Yes. Okay, I remember that song. Yes. I'm old um, enough to remember it, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it was around the 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 same kind of eighties eighties mark. Yes, I'm like, da, 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 exactly. Da, 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 da. Exactly All right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was and actually remember... that was actually about the same time when Frere Young came out. Exactly. Yeah. And then I think a year later it was covered by the Flying Pickets and they Right, were... right. Yeah, I met that guy. I met these guys. I really want well, the... it was kind of a cappella, wasn't it? It was a whole a cappella. Yeah, it was complete a cappella. Yeah. Yeah, so I did that sort of version again, which, um, what an amazing era that must have been. When did you, um, let's get straight into it, because I've got so, I've actually got so many questions for you um, regarding this song, which is why it's so lovely that we get to do this, I mean, 2020 with technology. Um, did you, how did the song, when did you, was this your first break or had there been other songs were you signed before forever young um how did it come around yeah that was uh, i mean that that song was on our first uh, uh album which came out in 1984 and um yeah we i mean we we were we were really lucky bastards because uh, we um we didn't tour very much nobody knew us you know we got this record deal without any problems because of uh, a couple of demos that we presented to the rec company. And then we did the first single and it became a number one all over Europe. Wow. And that was that. So it was really, I mean, we had a really easy start. It was, uh, yeah, it was like, uh, like a dream in a way, you know, and it still what, continues. What, so, um, what label were you a part of? Warner. Okay. That was my first record too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not with Universal, but, uh, uh, uh but, uh, that changed um, at the mil changed millennium about that time. So, right. But they are only. 
I mean, there are only two big companies anyway. That... Pr pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so either there, here or there, you know. Yeah, and they're all much of a muchness anyway, I kind of find. But um, I won't get into label politics. Yeah. Um, how did you, how, how, so talk me through your songwriting process back in the 80s. Um, how did, did you write as a band together? Yeah, and we well, still do. Oh, we're, we're still writing songs. I mean, I'm, I'm very depending on um, teamwork. You know, I'm, I'm a very bad player. And, uh, you know, I, I started as a singer, so I was the laziest person in the band. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I really, I mean, I have lots of ideas. And, well, I, I use a, the piano in a way like a typewriting machine, you know. Mm -hmm. You remember typewriters? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, just about. Just yeah, about. right. So like a keyboard, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and I mean, but uh, you know, I think it. What really matters is what what you what you got on your mind. I think you know what you uh, an original idea. You know, this is the most important thing. I think you know it doesn't matter how good the production is, or you know what what kind of musicians you use, or which connections you have. You know, you need. You need a good original idea for everything you do and uh, and a little bit of talent. Yeah, right timing. I mean, sometimes you don't yeah. even need talent. It's, uh, I mean, especially nowadays. <laughs> sometimes somebody <laughs> else is producing it and you just put it out and do your name. Um, that's sick, man. So, so, well, there must be some talent. In some, in some directions, there should be some talent. Somewhere, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah great. How, uh, <laughs> How, so I'm guessing, did, did the title come first? Uh, no, actually, uh, the music was written by my uh, uh, bandmate uh, uh, Bernard, and he came up. He he wrote this this, this music piece uh, with uh, Frank, the third member of the band, and they came along and uh, played me a tape with their music, and I was very much intrigued by that. And I said, I sat down and wrote the lyrics within, I don't know, 45 minutes, something like that. Wow. And um, yeah, and then I, I, I sang it to them and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the song as it is now, but I'm not sure about the chorus. I think I changed the chorus line a little bit and the two said, oh, no, no, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so they kind of saved the song. <laughs> Did you I, was, I was really close to fuck it up. To, to, to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm always like that. I always have to ask somebody to be like, no, 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 it's, fine. it's all right the way it is. Le leave it. Yeah, actually, leave it. yeah that's it. <laughs> so it's good if there are some people around, you know, which uh, have a little bit of control or what, you know, because it's such a subjective thing, you know, and, and sometimes you're just too close, you know, to what you're doing. So there's always, for me, it's very important that there are other people around that, uh, Mm. Yeah, they tell me something, even if I never listen, but, you know, sometimes it, <laughs> it helps. Did you know you were writing, did you know you had a number one worldwide hit when you wrote it? Did no, you no, I, I, I never, I never uh, think very much about it when I write a song. I never it, is, uh, it only would make me nervous, you know, and, and it would yeah. give me responsibility in all this bullshit. You know, I, I'm not very much into responsibility and all these uh, <laughs> adult things. Well, I always think that once you start writing music with the audience in mind, that's when the song kind of suffers a little bit. If you have, you have to be quite self-indulgent when you write songs. And then I don't know. I'm not sure about that because I mean, an, an audience is something. Is something for me. An audience is something different than the public. You know, the audience that are. I mean, when I'm when we're doing concerts, you know, the audience this is a friend. This, these are our friends, and writing to to friends is uh, is uh, is a different thing than writing to an anonymous uh, people. You know, so I mean, yeah. it feels like you you very much in contact with everybody, each and everyone in the in the audience. You know, so you're very close to these people, and they give you so so much. You know, when you when you when you're there on stage, and mm -hmm. uh, um, when I think about the audience, it's very easy actually because. Um, I, um, 
when, when I think about the public, it's like I prostitute myself. You know, I think about what could, what would they like or something. That's what when I you, mean. When you write to your That's friends, I mean. you know, or when you write yeah. to the audience, you write to somebody else, and and that that is a complete different thing. You know, that it's lots of fun actually, and and then you really want to know what they like, and if you could twist the song like this and that and that, yeah, and then they're really gonna like it. You know, wow, and especially when you're in the studio, you basically do your own thing. Yeah. And uh, and then you go out and play the song, and then you then you redo the, the most of the songs we we completely redo because uh, uh, it's it's totally uninteresting to play the song just as they are, you know, like like on the on the on the, on the record or you know whatever. And um, <clears throat> so then we really start to think about other people, what other people might, how they would react if you do this or that with the song. You know, that, that is mm -hmm. the two different worlds in a way, you know, so it's great to have them both. Do you, do you feel like it's quite ironic that the song is called Forever Young and yet it's been generations of people and now I've, I kind of feel like I'm with McDonald's, I'm introducing a whole new audience or, or new generation, this song, because I was introduced to Forever Young with Mr. Hudson and Kanye. All right. When I was probably about 12 or 13. I can't really remember what year that was put out. So when, and I remember hearing the original then as a, as a comparison to what Kanye and Mr. Hudson had done. Um, and what's quite mad now is that there's a, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm you mean, you, you're talking about uh, Jay-Z probably. Was it Jay-Z, not Kanye? It was Jay-Z. Well, anyway, you know, it's just, it's just the other end of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was Jay-Z and Mr. Hudson. Right. Had you, when that came through, because I'm guessing you have to clear everything for anybody to want to cover a song, you guys have to say yes or no to whether you want that person to cover it. Um, no, not to a cover. I mean, to a cover, you don't need to do that. It's basically when they change things of the composition. For instance, there was a lot of t uh, lyrics were added to the song and they needed, uh, uh, they needed the permission from, from our side. But normally when you cover, for instance, I, uh, I covered a song from David Bowie, you know, which is one of my biggest heroes. And uh, I, I did not have to ask him, you know, it's, it's, uh, right. if, I, if I play along the composition I, ch I don't change the lyrics, also I can do whatever I want with the song, you know, which is, it's not a problem. But when they change something like heavy chord changes or, you know, twisting of the lyrics or whatever, you know, then you That's have right, to ask. Yeah, yeah my music business mm -hmm. uh, fails me at the moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, how, how does it is, it, is it weird hearing your songs through the generations and having them still be really relevant now as much as it was back in the 80s? Uh, it, is, it is very, um, I don't know, it's just great. I mean, it's just great when you write a piece of music which is uh, alive through all the generation, all the, the change of time, you know, it seems to be a kind of immortal piece. And, um, it, uh, Pharaoh Young in this respect is a, it's really a phenomenon, you know, because um, it is, uh, yeah, it's just in a, in a way it is immortal, although it, 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 it deals with mortality in the end, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it, 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 it plays with the idea of being forever young, but it, actually, you know, it is impossible, we all know that, that this is an impossible dream apart from any philosophical or religious uh, yeah. perspectives. And, um, so, uh, it, it, you know, it is just, uh, my, my, my favorite line, for instance, you know, in, in, in the lyrics, this is, um, um, uh, so many, so many adventures, uh, you know, the, so many adventure thing, you know, yeah. what, what we, what we, what we sing, you know, before the second, the second chorus, you know, so many adventures couldn't happen today, you know, and, uh, so there's still so many things you could do and, uh, you know, which is, uh, one life is not enough, you know, actually, but yeah. that is exactly the thing. I think when, when our life would be big enough, you know, to do all the things we, we, we wanted, you know, I think there were no motivation anymore. In mm. us. 
<clears throat> it's interesting. My my favorite lyric is actually the beginning of that second verse, which is some of the melody, some of the beat. Um, so some are like water, some are like some are like the heat, like the heat, some yeah, melody, right. some are the beat. <laughs> but I love how that is kind of why why do they have to die young? Do you know what I mean? Why why does that have to end? I think recently I've been massively struggling with mortality generally and want to know who the manager of life is so I can send them a strongly worded email about how you, you're right, like sometimes in some cases the mind stays young but the body doesn't and it's a really interesting concept especially to have, you know, still going through each, it's, it's something that everybody will always feel until immortality gets invented. I'm sure that'll be 2031. Um, Maybe. But, <laughs> but it's a really what it, it's it's a really incredible concept, and and I've seen people react to the advert on TV now in a way that's like, oh, you know, what an amazing concept to have a little teenage boy who doesn't want to interact with his mum because he thinks it's uncool, and he, you know, he's kind of growing out of it. But actually, you know, the whole spirit of Christmas and the whole spirit of life is to kind of stay as young as you know, stay as young as you feel. Um, do you feel like that now? Do you do you still look back and feel like the last 30, 40 years have been a bit of a blur and that actually it all feels like it happened yesterday? I know. I mean, I, I have a, probably a more profane uh, look at it. Uh, it's, uh, I don't care very much about the past. You know, I'm... I, 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 I'm I have lots, lots of ideas in my mind, you know, and I have, I have no time to, to reflect. And I, I'm so much occupied with uh, with with my my own plans, and you know what I, what I'm what I'm intending to do. So uh, yeah, sometimes uh, something happens in your life, and you start to look back and uh, see. Uh, well, okay, my friend, he looks much older, <laughs> but I'm I'm, I'm okay. I mean... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, and then you you start to 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 see that uh, you know time time goes by. But um, no, it's it, uh, the the past not a problem for me. You know, it's uh, and 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 the, the future also, it's not a problem. It's just a, a matter of uh, ideas that project you into the future. And, and this is a and playing. You know, it's playing. Mm. You know, as an as an artist, you can play like a dolphin your whole life. You know that that's. That's the thing. That's all what we, you know, that's the best thing that can happen in one's life. I, I mean, to my life, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful, you know, that I, I became what I, uh, what I am, you know, a musician. And, um, and I, still, I still got ideas and I still work on, on the future, you know, on, on, mm. on, on whomever future, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, but uh, actually, um, my oldest daughter she uh, she uh, she came up uh, i think it was uh, 2014 or something about that time and you had a, had a very nice song at that time called gecko and that yeah, was her favorite song <laughs> you know so that was the first time i heard about you <laughs> and when wow. when she heard you know that we we talking we talking to her she said oh yeah this is a singer you know and, this is so gecko you know and and then she told me also many many other uh, other other songs of yours you know uh, which, which are actually a few of them I know anyway, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it is. I really like to do this tonight. I really, I really like to do this. Same, because I think it's so. It's, it's not only an honor to be able to cover somebody else's song, especially one that you know has had so much impact over generations of people for 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 decades, but to be able to sit and kind of pick your brain about you know, how it was written and, 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 you know, whether you knew what you had written at the time and, you know, the idea that a song can transcend its time that it was written and still be relevant. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to say. I, I feel very grateful to be sat here talking to you, actually. But when I, you're writing, when you're writing your own material, never think too much about those things, you know. I never do. <laughs> I've had to stop myself because I think I learned this at quite a young age that when I actually started writing music because I was wanting it to be 
for you know liked by a lot of other people it stopped me from writing music that was going to be accessible for a lot of other people but it's um it's interesting when you get into your own head about songwriting and it's 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 one of those things that i feel like i've definitely gotten better at doing it but i still have days where i write a shit song and sometimes i have days where i write a great song but there's never a constant line of just being able to write great songs all the time. Some weeks I'll come out and I'll be like, I've just written a week's worth of shit songs. Um, but what is a that, shit song? I mean, what, how, do, how do you consider well, a shit song when you wrote? And that's another thing. It's all opinion based as well. Do you, <laughs> um, do you find it difficult to write in English as it's, I'm guessing it's your second language, you being from Germany, right? Yeah, well, there are parts of my family living in, in, uh, in the UK. Any, anyway, and uh, so my, my uncle and my aunt, they live in London. Oh, no way. And uh, so, yeah, we, we, we have very, very close connection to, uh, to, to England. And, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't, actually, I wasn't never much thinking about which, which language I should write music. I mean, it's, it just came out quite, quite, quite naturally. Um, and, um, that that was never a question. That was never a question. I I I I cannot I cannot tell what what drove me to write. And we also have a, a couple of German uh, songs in our repertoire. But you know, when we did, for instance, when we did the first album and we checked the songs, you know, there was a big question because it was a German release. So shall we do? And at that time, at that time, it was really like very very important. Uh, uh, market-wise, you know, to write German songs in, in German language in Germany. And um, so it was the big question, you know, and uh, then we checked the songs, you know, and all the good songs were in English. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that answers the question about shit songs and good songs. <laughs> it's only because one English respect, is too lazy yeah. to listen to other songs in other languages. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but this this was actually not the reason, you know. It 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 it, it proved to be a big uh, advantage for us later on, you know, when we started to tour, you know, that because with the English lyrics, you know, you you be under, understood all over the planet, basically, yeah. you know, and English, Spanish, or Chinese, you know, Chinese would be a problem for me, you know, because I'm not very much uh, very good into that. You know, Spanish would be okay, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there will come a time actually when when we all gonna re-record -re our songs in Chinese, you know, because it's such a big market. You know? I mean, it's the number one spoken language, Mandarin, Absolutely. I think. In Mandarin. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I've got a few questions from people who have um, written in. My favorite being, do you? Because I'm really interested in this. Do you have any songwriting tips? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I, I still, um, I, I mean, I, I still try. I mean, sometimes I try to analyze how I'm writing songs, and every every time it's different. It's a different thing, and every time it it depends on so many coincidences, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for instance, you know, like the chorus of Forever Young, or for instance, our, our first. Big hit we had, you know, was a song called Big in Japan. And um, <clears throat> I wrote this song like in 79. And then we, we got this record deal in 83. And uh, Bernard said, what about, what about Big in Japan? Shall we include it into the production? I said, no, it's, it's so old. The song is so old. No, no. And then he really had to convince me, you know, uh, to, to do that. And... Uh, yeah, and it was the first number one we had. And um, wow. I mean, if I had total control just myself, you know, then I had I had made so many mistakes. You know, it it, it it's not only business wise; it's also during the process process of uh, uh, of, of the writing. You know, team writing is just yeah. I mean, it's just especially when you when you're working with friends or people you're close to. It's just a very fulfilling. Thing and very interesting and it gives so it adds so much more to the music mm. you know so well the only uh, no i can't give an even there might be there might be even moments for instance once you know i woke up or i dreamt i dreamt a song you know i was just dreaming the song i i i, I was dreaming like i was playing 
um, I was playing these chords, you know, on the piano and I was singing and then I woke up and the, the, I had the song in my mind completely, you know. Well, actually, the, the, the chords were stolen from Bob Marley, <laughs> you know, but I mean, in my dreams, you know, I, I created a new song out of these, out of these chords and I uh, think all a really beautiful song. Bob Marley. And then I, I re we recorded it and it was a song for the next album. So that's also a way, you know, how to compose. No, you, you dream the songs. It's not the first time. It, was, it happened a few times in my life that I dreamed a song. And uh, I, sometimes it's just, I mean, uh, there, there was this guy, uh, he was a journalist, and he, um, he, he wrote a very evil review about a band that I really liked. And I hated this guy for this. And I thought, I am going to write a song about him. <laughs> you know, a hate song. <laughs> Hot Chip. I tell you, there was another band that did that. Hot Chip did a song called Over and Over, which is, a, which is an incredible song. But most of the lyrics are written from, I think they had a review that was like, they're, they're like, it's like listening to a monkey with a miniature symbol. The music just goes over <laughs> and over, and that became Great. the lyrics. Fantastic! Of a really bad review. Yeah, so I it's love it. It's a that. really good idea for lyrics. I, I mean, I'm I'm waiting for my bad review to write a song about it. It is a good <laughs> yeah, idea. Yeah, we should all collect them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a comment here that says, "My friends and I have been debating what big in Japan is actually about. Could you clarify it for us?" Great question. Big in Japan, well, it's just, this is a very strange story uh, about this song because, um, um, again, in the late 70s, you know, I, I was uh, like, almost like a homeless person in Berlin, you know, I was, uh, I was living on the streets and um, there, was this, uh, there was this club, uh, the SO36 in Kreuzberg, and uh, somebody told me that David Bowie would sometimes he would be there because that was a time when he, he lived in Berlin. So I went a couple of times, I went into this club to, uh, hoping to see, not to meet him. I would have never ever dared, you know, to come close to him, but just to see him from the distance. Uh, and um, he, was never, he was never there, but there was another guy who, who sold records, you know, in a, in a kind of, I don't know, in a mobile, kind of mobile thing. Yeah. And um, so uh, one, one night I, I I bought one of the, one of his record, and the record was uh, from a band, from a British band called Big in Japan. Oh, no. And um, uh, well, a couple couple of months later, you know, I started to make music in my own with a friend of mine, and and we had this we had a, this lovely bass line, you know, which from a sequencer we we programmed because we couldn't play at all, so everything we had to do was programming. And uh, it was this didin 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 didin, and uh, I was I wrote the lyrics, and then I I was looking for a kind of for for a sentence you know for a line for the chorus, and I remembered the name of that band, and that was the the birth of uh, Big in Japan. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, four years later, when we when we uh, when the song was released, we um, uh, we were. We were number two in Germany and was so close to, to become number one. But there was one band that was every, every week they sold a, a few records more than us. You know, it was uh, Frank Goes to Hollywood, it was Relax. And, and, and after three or four weeks, you know, then we changed place and we became number one. And the lead singer from, uh, from that band, Holly Johnson, he used to be the lead singer from that British band Big in Japan. No way, full circle. That's so <laughs> weird. Isn't that weird? I mean, it's really strange, isn't it? It's I really mean, strange. If life has given you any more of a sign that you're doing the right thing, it's that. That's yeah, incredible. absolutely, yeah. Amazing. Right. And what about Forever Young? Because I've obviously I've heard that I've I've been told there is some relation to um, the atomic bomb. In, in Hiroshima, actually, is that is there any truth in that? Because I know that kind of bombs are mentioned and 
No, it's, uh, it's just a general, it's just a general thing. You know, the 80s, you know, were under the threat of this uh, atomic, uh, uh, this atomic uh, umbrellas, you know, uh, you know, from the east and from the west. Yeah. And, um, and uh, it, it was just, uh, it was just a major thing in the back of, of everybody's mind, you know, so in a way it had, had to do a lot with, with the idea of being mortal or immortal or forever young or you know life or death and all these things you know the the atomic bomb was one really important uh, uh symbol you know for this con for this inner conflict uh, at that time to me it seems everything was divided into two everything there was the east and the west the good and the bad the communism the capitalism mm -hmm. um and it was Everybody thought it was a very complicated world. I mean, but if I compare it to our present world now, it, it was so, so simple. Yeah. <laughs> it was really easy. And um, yeah, and we were all living under this, this pressure and this threat of immediate nuclear uh, burnout, whatever, you know. So um, yeah, that was the reason that, that uh, I had this, this line, you know. In, uh, that I put this line into the song, you know, about the atomic that bomb. It's just I'm the bomb. Right? That was actually, that was, when, when somebody said at that time, you know, they said, the bomb, everybody knew it was the atomic bomb. You know, it was not right. any bomb. Wow, and that's, that's so, because it's, it's difficult now, I feel like m music, do you feel like music, Kind of popular music has changed somewhat over over the last thirty years. Do you feel? Yeah, like because music is a constant now? changing. It's constant changing. Music is uh, is an ever changing thing. That's that's so great about it. Because I feel, it's, I, I feel like there the, you couldn't really talk about nuclear bombs in in, in current pop songs. Do, do you know what I mean? It, there, there's there's a certain level of creative freedom that I feel like was in the 80s, where, for example, you could do three verses, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Like that, that was like mm. the normal structure of a song, whereas now it's like, how quick can we get to a chorus? You know, if you're, if you're... We had the same problem, we had the same problem at the, at the time. The, 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 oh, really? You know, these are industry problems, you know, that's not, yeah. there's nothing to do with the artists. They're coming, can we say, a chorus must come minimum after one minute, you know, right. that, was, that was the unwritten law in the 80s, for instance, you know, now it's even, but, but I mean, there are so, you, you mentioned Kenny West, for instance, you know, and uh, I mean, there are so many really, really uh, successful people and they, they don't give a shit about all these things and they yeah. are also very, very successful. So I, I think you don't need to really listen to much. Um, to listen to what, what, what they say. Don't listen to what they say. That's a good idea. Oh, this has oh, been that's really awesome. inspiring. <laughs> that's, this is amazing. Thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm going right. um, to ask you about your new album. Is there anything you want to plug while, while we're here? And we've got over 100 people watching. You've got a new album coming. Thunder Baby, is that going to be before Christmas? Or is that going to no, be... No, no, no. No, we... Uh, impossible. No, we, we're not... Um, we're not gonna uh, not gonna finish it. We can't finish the album this year. It's, um, the the problem with the band is that it's a co international thing, you know. So we have players, um, the guitar player is actually from London, you know. Uh, our bass player, she is from from Munich, and uh, uh, the the keyboard is from from uh, from a, a town in in West West Germany, you know. So we are scattered all over the place, you know. And, and because of the pandemic, we can't come together. So Mm. Uh, we we communicate via the digital, digital and social media and and um, and it's it's a really slow process in a way. So and Alphabet traditionally is a very slow hippie electronic hippie band. <laughs> in a way, so, I mean, yeah, I mean we're really great in frustrating our fans in a way, saying, yeah, next year we come into next album. And, uh, no, the next year then no. <laughs> and it's really. Yeah, disgusting. Well, so, um, I wish you all the best of luck to get you know, together next year. All right. Thank you ever so much. It's been a yeah, thank, thank, I mean, I had also a few questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just been fascinating to hear you talk. It's almost like I don't really want to say too much, but please, <laughs> ask away. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, I mean, um, 
what what are actually what what are your future plans or what you know what what is from where who who influenced you you know who, who was you know the starting point for you who, who who were your musical heroes you know what what really is your background where, where are you coming i mean you're coming from me you're coming out of the blue you know i mean with, <laughs> well, with gecko I, gecko <laughs> to be fair i have done with a lot of people and i think this is how i've kind of i've i've felt frustration being an artist because i've felt like i've had a lot of commercially successful tracks from yeah. people like Matoma and Oliver Heldens and people like MK, you know. Who, yeah, fantastic. Who, right. who, who are massive, but yeah, I felt like the the DJ has gotten more recognition for the song than the song person who has written the song <clears throat> and sings the song. So for me, it's been very difficult. I started writing music, I started playing guitar. My big brother probably was the person to get me into it. He played guitar. I then learned when I was about 10, started writing music when I was 13. Um, and then I ended up, I, I was having a really dark year when I was 17 and I didn't know how to get out of the small town I lived in and didn't know what to do with my life. I saw no sort of professional validation with being a musician. I didn't think it would make me any money. Um, and then I, I went on the TV show, The Voice. Um, I know they have it in Germany as well, right? Yeah. So I was on the very first series of that. Um, and then was sort of under the illusion that, well, actually I wasn't. I, I, talent shows when I was growing up had a reputation that once you went on them, you became a pop star in your own right. Whereas my experience of being on The Voice wasn't really like that. I came off the show and it was almost like I'd been on TV in front of six million people, but I was back pouring pints behind um, the bar, like when I came off the show. So mm -hmm. for me, I had to go and knock on doors. Um, I kept a lot of contacts that I made off the show and I just rang round and was like, hello. Um, um, my name's Becky, I've just done this TV show, I really want to get into the music industry, but I have no idea how. Um, and that's when I met my manager, um, who was a part of the management company that my judge, Jesse, my coach, Jesse J, she, she was a part of this management company. Um, and my manager was the first guy I spoke to there, and we hit it off straight away. And I was kind of offered money and gigs, um, I had one management company say that we've got the best agents in the country. We can make you X amount of money within six months. Um, and then I went to another management company and they went, Becky, if you want to write music, if you write good music, good money will follow. And I just, it was a proper reality check for me. I was kind of like, oh, I've, I've, that's all I've ever wanted to do is write music and sing yeah. music and perform. So I went off. I, I just started writing my album and trying to find who I was as an artist, my sound. So Space, space, uh, space for instance, is, you wrote that song yourself. Yeah, I wrote it with a guy yeah. called Josh Records. Beautiful, beautiful song, very great Thank song. Thank you really so really. much. Um, and, and that for me was probably, you see my, whenever anybody asks me for my songwriting tips, I always say, write how, sing how you would say it. I, I'm a very literal writer. I like to write, songs the way I would have a conversation um, and that just people started to resonate with that over other people's tracks so I kind of always needed to sort of piggyback somebody else with a lot of exposure to be able to get exposed myself and, and I found it I found it really difficult to kind of make a name for myself and get people to recognize that name mm -hmm. um, I suppose I've never really been that confident to be in videos or be in my artwork so people haven't really been able to put a face to the name um and it was only a few years ago that i was like fuck this like i'm just gonna make peace with who i am and how i am and how i look and and the way i am and stop thinking that everybody expects me to be this sort of thing and and to get attention for that and just go for it so the last couple of years have been probably the most successful years of my career in terms of public knowledge um i was touring with a band at the beginning of this year called the script and um 
And, and at the beginning of the support set, I'd always say, how many people didn't recognize the name on the bill? And I'd see a load of hands go up. And I'd say, how many of you knew my songs? And the same hands would stay up. People knew the songs, but they didn't necessarily know the name. Right. And what's so nice now, and what <clears throat> I feel like this Christmas has bought me is like, not everybody has a radio, not everybody listens to the radio, but everybody has a TV. And for me, being able to sing such a classic song in a way that is kind of, I'm, a, I'm generally, I like to sing very loud and powerfully, but this was like a really inward vocal for me. This was kind of like, how soft could I sing these lyrics? How much emotion could I put into this? And especially after seeing the visual of the little boy with his mom, you know, I really wanted to capture that soft side of Forever Young which does speak to people who, you know, kind of should forget all the other shit or any other added emotion, or if they feel bad about something or angry at something, mm. that actually life's just too fucking short, which is what is so lovely about being able to sing Forever Young. And not only that, it's like to get onto TV and have a beautiful advert go along with this beautiful song this is probably the most, this feels like the beginning. I've been in the industry for nearly 10 years now. So I've been, I've been on my grind for a while. I'm 26 now, I'm soon to be turning 27. And like, this feels like the beginning for me, which is why it's just so weird that I'm singing such a powerful song with such a powerful advert that's now going on television. So hopefully now loads of people will recognize my voice. Hopefully people will, would have done the groundwork and kind of gone off and you know the next release i do hopefully people go wait i know that voice and i can invest in that person as an artist like now it's so difficult because physical records aren't a thing which is why i ask you do you think music has changed over the last 30 years spotify spotify's kind of created this weird thing where people don't I've always dreamed of, of writing an album. I used to listen to albums in my bedroom. One of my biggest influences is Robin. Um, and she's always done that synth pop singer songwriter. She started off doing R&B then started doing um, synth pop, which for me is like an 80s throwback generally because 80s music is, you know, when the birth of synth pop happened is such a carefree genre of music. You know, there's so many different weird noises and things that people hadn't heard of at the time that is now being repeated through music productions in this day and age. And I've always loved that kind of carefree, anything can kind of happen vibe um, with synth pop. So I've, mm -hmm. I've always dreamed of putting an album out and a body of work, you know, that doesn't necessarily have the big hitting singles, but say something <laughs> about an artist. So... For, but it, it, it's weird because Spotify has created this landscape now where people can just skip to the next song or skip to the next artist. And it's much harder to break through. Um, I did a podcast actually called The Art of Rave, all about art, um, rave music from the 90s, right? Which is an era I would have loved to have been born like in the 80s and gone raving in the 90s. Yeah. It sounds fucking mental. But they were saying that you know, people would get signed and things would get in the charts quicker because there was less around. And because as you said, like probably in the eighties, you were having to program everything by hand. So everything was analog. If you made a mistake on the tape, you'd have to go back to the beginning of the tape and make sure you played that right. Or you'd have a happy accident and it would come into something else. Like, because everybody can sit in their bedroom now and produce off their laptop, and they don't need all this fancy, expensive gear, there's so much more music now, and it's, like, harder for artists like me to break through. But this is the nice thing, is, like, hopefully now, you know, as you said, there was 2014, I had, I had Gecko and Overdrive, and I had this song called False Alarm, which did really well, um, and worked with MK a few times now, hopefully people will start to see me as a singer song or, or in my own right. Um, and this has only just helped me. So thank you so much. All right. So uh, is, there, is there an album coming out after, after yeah. the singer? And when, when, when will it be? 
Well, the label initially said March, which right. I think is a little bit too soon, given the current can the pandemic and stuff. Um, I don't know when this is going to finish. And also, I don't really want to release an album without being able to tour the album. I think that's so important. Um, and also, I've been working for eight years on this album. Like, I want to be able to, pardon me, sing it in a live capacity. So I think the album's coming in May. Um, so we're just tying it all up now and making sure it's all ready to go before the year's out. So it's busy for me at the minute, but um, yeah, yeah. I couldn't think of anything better to be doing. So that's no, I'm I'm pretty, pretty optimistic about that. We, you know, from March on, you know, everything will be fine. I'm, I'm we hope so because yeah. i miss festivals um, festivals are the thing that i've really mm. missed the most this year it's my favorite time of year and i'm sure you've missed touring the world and oh going jesus to yes i do i mean it's just like i mean for the last 30 years i was i mean we touring constantly you know we um basically over the weekends you know and and mm. sometimes we we're in singapore sometimes we're in north america some uh i don't know you know or in, somewhere in europe so we travel a lot and um, and that all came down, you know, from from March on, you know, and, and since uh, I've never been at home f for such a long time, you know, it's it's, <laughs> it's interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> on the on the other hand, you know, I'm grateful. You know, I see the kids for much longer, and you know, and and we, yeah, it's it's, it's the good things about it. You know, it, it feels like an eternal holiday in a way. But how do you um, find touring? Do you get on with it? Because I know that some people find it taxing on their mental health some people find it difficult being away from people how did you find it well the the band is my second family so right. um, i mean it's just it's very important that i can see these guys and and together you know and doing the concert and then having having a, a drink afterwards you know and uh just doing the rock and roll thing you know this is one half of of the existence you know the other half is the studio and um <clears throat> yeah really i'm in the beginning, I was just quite happy. You know, the first two or three months, you know, I thought, yeah, great, I can stay at home. You know, I can I have lots of time to write music and and so on, you know, but I'm really, I'm really, I'm so happy that they finally find this, this vaccine. And yeah. I hope that uh, everything uh, will be out of this mess, you know, by, by the end of February, or the beginning of March. Yeah, we hope hopefully. so. Yeah. So, well, if you play london can i can you let me know i would love absolutely yeah i would i would really london. like to i would really like to see you and um yeah it was i mean also from for my side it was a great pleasure talking to you so thank i you wish so you much. all the best all the best for your for your future you. for your tc future i mean we keep in touch okay yes 100 right? right. i mean this, okay. this is going to go over christmas anyway so i'm sure yeah. I'll be able to before christmas but um hopefully Fantastic. meet you in real life in 2021 yeah. and and you give me your tour dates <laughs> yes, I shall. Hopefully we'll be coming to Germany at some point. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks everyone. That would be great. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you very Take much. Care. Thank you for your bye. time. Bye bye. And you thanks. Bye. Bye.